thank you very much. Um, my um, questions are uh, directed to um, Professor Boyd, but uh, Mr. Conroy or anyone else, if you wanted to respond. Um, I, I'm, a thought came to my mind as I was listening to you about the issue of, uh, of home grow and the likelihood of people wanting to actually grow their own and you're saying you don't think it'll be a lot. And one of the problems we have, of course, is none of us know, you know, um, I think we're taking a big leap here and your recommendation is, you know, do as much as you can to, you know, to make this a, um, a public health uh, and uh, approach as opposed to a prohibition approach. I'm, I'm interested in the likelihood of people wanting to grow. And um, it, this, these two examples come from BC, and I'm sorry, this is anecdotal. That's not the best uh, evidence, but we don't have a lot of evidence. But I know two people who, in the early days of medical uh, marijuana, uh, got their certification to receive it, whatever the language is, and then also a license to grow. And it was up, uh, both of these people, it was up to 10 plants. I don't know if that's standard or if there were uh, other amounts, but they both had uh, ability to grow up to, t to 10 plants. Both of them, within the course of uh, a year or so, gave up that and didn't renew that license and didn't, didn't grow. And one of the reasons was the proliferation of dispensaries where they could just go and buy it, where they had more choice um, you know, uh, for the product that they wanted, for the reason that they wanted it. Uh, and, pres and that's the illicit market, but that gave them um, some ease of access that, you know, made those two people at least abandon the, uh, the grow um, operations that they had of only 10 uh, plants. Is, did you see other examples of that um, and or does that figure into your assumptions that this won't be a really popular option for people. I should preface this by saying I, I now live in northern Ontario and as I travel to different communities in northern Ontario talking about this, uh, mainly rural communities, most people are aghast that uh, it would be four plants because they grow more than that now. Not usually in their house, usually outside. <laughs> it's a northern, northern uh, um, environment, so it's a summer activity there. But in any event, um, I'm interested in these 10 plants. <laughs> I, I think one of the keys is to, to think about it in terms of what's available. Uh, we know, for example, with alcohol, very few of us um, would want to, to make our own uh, wine. We can't produce the quality that's available at a relatively inexpensive price in a, in a liquor store. Uh, and the dispensaries are proving much the same point with respect to cannabis. They have a, a wide number of strains with varying CBD and THC levels, something we didn't even talk about five to ten years ago. And, and, and so I, I think most people aren't going to want to go down that road, um, provided that um, the price is reasonable. And we have to remember that in terms of price per unit, uh, alcohol a legal drug is much more expensive than cannabis, an illegal drug. So, you know, I'm not sure that uh, we have to be all that worried about um, that kind of issue. And I would grant that it's going to vary to some extent depending on where one lives. In Vancouver, where, where you know, we come from, um, it's, it's a very different environment. And, uh, and it wouldn't make sense for most people who use either recreationally or medicinally or some combination of the two uh, to, to start to grow. Um, it, it would be counterproductive for, for many. The 10 grams uh, that you mentioned would mean that those people were approved, uh, their dosage Ten was one to, one to three Ten. grams. One to three grams a day would give you ten, ability to grow 10 plants. Okay. Okay, so that's the lowest, uh, usually the lowest dosage, and there are many medical patients that have far greater uh, dosages. And in fact, there were 38,000 at the time of March of 2014 when the injunction was obtained. And I understand there's over 200,000 people now who have medical permits to grow and, and possess. But as I said, the evidence in Allard indicated that when the government uh, MMPR process wasn't working and getting the medicine to the patients, they voted with their feet and went to the dispensaries. So I agree with, with Professor Boyd that 
most people don't want to grow. It, it costs money to grow. It's complicated. Here in BC, I mean, there's a huge industry that grew up. You know, in the early days, the, the stuff came up by boatloads from Thailand and Colombia and so on. And then BC became an export economy. People were growing it in basements under lights. And there's all this technology and everything that's developed in order to make it safe and so on and so forth. Even engineered solutions, the bloom box where you put everything in and everything's taken care of. You will have some people doing that. And you've got some people who are you know, really very, uh, uh, <laughs> very, very anxious to be able to do that and so on. But I think like with alcohol, like with tobacco, most people won't. And most people, hopefully, if we have a good retail developed market, uh, we should be okay. I should quickly add, though, that the person that you're talking about, if they were uh, doing, uh, going to the dispensary because they couldn't, uh, didn't want to grow, and you say they're going to end the illegal market, if the dispensary was one that made sure they had a medical card, which you say they had, then arguably all that dispensary is doing is filling the gap that the government has failed to provide in providing reasonable access, which the courts ruled back in 2001 the government had to do in the Parker case. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator